Hello, everyone. We're going to have a little bit different presentation today. Just bear with us a few minutes and we'll get started. Hello, Stephen. Hello. Just going to wait a few. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can see it well. Great. All right. We'll just uh, wait maybe a minute here. Let everyone come in and then uh, I'll share my screen uh, again. More live video. So today, Stephen, we're going to be presenting a little bit kind of a history on the on, on the Katsu equipment itself with uh, all of our webinars and we've been talking about what we can do now. I thought it might be interesting today to, for people to kind of see where where everything came from. So, uh, and then we'll put this recording onto our YouTube as usual, but this is just gonna really be uh, an in-depth dive into everything, um, well, not everything, but some of the, the major developments that we've had over the last few years of the Katsu equipment. So I'm going to, uh, that's why I called it the past, present, and future. And uh, certainly please chime in, Stephen, whenever you think. Let me stop sharing my screen. And hello. So um, if we think of present, Steve, and, uh, you know, with our new Katsu C4, that I have here. Let me change my screen so I don't have a blurry background. And I apologize for space. I tried to find a space where I could put out all our equipment. So it's right behind me. And I thought I'd just sort of show everything from the beginning to where we are now with the C4. Uh, any any problems with that, Steve? No, go ahead. Great. So, um, of course, for anyone here today, appreciate you being here and we'll we will have some q a at the end but um wanted to show all of you what uh where, where we came from so um and, and again steve will chime in on anything i i miss but as a performance director for the company i'm been really intrigued on how not only has the equipment changed in performance but how we approach using katsu in our daily performance especially with our own health and wellness so for those of you that know uh, Dr. Sato, Yoshiaki Sato, started off um, with a very interesting discovery when he was uh, sitting in a, in, a, in a prayer position called Seiza. And when he uh, stood up, he had sort of a sensation of um, what in Japanese they call pidi pidi, which is basically the feeling of your leg going to sleep. And that's where he went on his discovery of how how did this happen? What was the physiological effect? And especially because he experienced a lot of muscle soreness. So in the beginning, um, I unfortunately don't yet have a photograph. It is in some of our blogs, some of the original bands and belts and ropes that Dr. Sato used to, and, and I, I'll give Stephen a moment to talk about that, but really it all started with not any technological equipment with using pneumatic bands or uh, devices, but it was with some very uh, primitive bands similar to these bands I have here. And you can see these are the Japanese medium, where there wasn't more than just a, and these are medium sized arm bands. You can see that they actually are very stiff because they're, um, they're non pneumatic and they've been in a bag for, for a long time. And you can see even back then they had some give and some stretch. But in order to ensure safety, and Stephen will be surprised that I even have one, I found it in my relics, is this was a device that Dr. Sato would use. And it is the actual bladder that they would place under the band. And again, Stephen, I'll have you correct me if I'm wrong. And they would test the pressure that they would, and you can see not the easiest system to use. They would actually test the pressure uh, and the, the pressure would read. Unfortunately, I don't have the, this is so old, I don't even have a charging unit for it. Um, it's battery. It could either be run by battery. So I have an old battery that's a uh, Toshiba. Uh, and that's how they would test the pressure. 
And as we all know now uh, with our SKU of your Katsu device. Um, so a long process just to make sure we were safe. So fast forward, the real first uh, machine that Dr. Sato used, and I have one here. Again, hopefully everyone's interested by this history. This was the first machine and you can see uh, it's not, I always called it the James Bond case, but this is all of you that are familiar with your equipment now, this is how it all started. So this was the original Katsu Master and hopefully Stephen, you can see, um, these are the original bands. So these are a set of leg bands and arm bands. And the device itself had, as we're all familiar with, the tubes. And you can see here, it looks like a, a, a control case from a, a James Bond movie. There's buttons for increasing the SKU, decreasing it. And what's very interesting is there's a button that says Katsu, and there's a button that says Joatsu, which is pressure off. So the original way that Dr. Sato would do the cycle is he would press the button pressure on. Stephen, that's correct, right? And then Joatsu pressure off. So really, uh, even back, and this is probably dates back uh, 20 plus years, this device. Um, and you can even see that it's it's aged a bit. So the, the clear tubes have now yellowed, uh, but it's still actually this, this device I can I can plug in. I have a an, uh, an adapter to the U.S. Um, because it's originally from Japan, and this is this is how we did Katsu was with this this device here. So this was the original master, and at the time of that machine, there was a, a lot of people, physical therapists or others in Japan, and they developed Stephen. Here it is the Katsu Master Mini. So this was, um, I don't even know if you knew I still had one, Steve. Katsu Master Mini. So you can see that Dr. Sato had the intentions of making Katsu more uh, attainable for people at home, but still uh, you, um, in Japan, you had to have uh, the proper certification, education to even use this device. So this was, where we started to see that Katsu could be more portable and at home. And this was the Katsu Master Mini. And again, you see Katsu. Uh, this one is at least updated. It doesn't say Joatsu, it says release. And um, there's the different modes, which was for the, the constant pressure and arms or legs down here. So this was the Katsu Mini. So, what did that all mean? Well, and then uh, I will um, honor Stephen a little bit. When he met Dr. Sato, we realized that there could be a whole new market to develop the equipment to be more attainable for, for people from physical therapists to athletic teams to people at home uh, like some of you here today and hopefully some people that watch this. Now, what's interesting is if you look at the original bands, you can see that they're, they are narrow. And that was something, uh, when we think about the development of the equipment, that was very important. It was that the narrow bands uh, in the correct placement, always on the upper arm or the upper leg, as we do now, back then, these narrow, uh, these original bands that were not pneumatic, well, then where did the equipment, uh, the, the bands were quite, um, this was a, this is an original arm band. And now these are pneumatic. So with the master that I showed you just previously, and you can see that um, these bands, very similar to the bands we have now, have this rounded bladder inside, very important and very unique to the Katsu equipment. Um, now, the development of the bands, you can see that originally we had bands that had two directions to tighten and it was quite difficult for people. So that's why now we've gone to a technique where you had to be quite agile to put the bands on, still always one finger tightness. And uh, you can see that the band on the upper arm as you place the bands or even 
the uh, original non-pneumatic bands. So these were the bands for the Katsu Master. Well, fast forward, we started to introduce Katsu to the US and the first device, and you can stop me at any point, Stephen, that we came up with was the Katsu Nano. So you can see it um, handheld, very similar size to the Mini Master. Um, and again, I apologize, I don't have this equipment plugged in. Uh, it may still go on. The batteries are pretty incredible. No, I need to charge it. So this was the Katsu Nano and um, cycle feature and the constant uh, pressure as we have now. So Katsu Nano was really what we first, and some of you may even still have this. This actually still works. I just need to charge it. Um, the unit has a left and right hole for the left and right arm. And you would also select arms or legs as we do now with the current equipment. So after the development of the Nano, we really started to understand the importance of the cycle. So from the Katsu Nano, we came out with a Katsu cycle, which actually was identical in look, but it only allowed you to cycle. So you can look, it almost looks identical, but Steven, this is one of our cycle um, devices that all, all we had, and that's where we really understood the importance of using cycle, not only for performance, but for recovery and rehabilitation. So these were the next generation devices. And at the same time we were developing the, the portable devices, we also, with physical therapy companies, uh, medical um, doctor's offices, or other high-end physical therapy offices, we developed the master from the, the, the large unit you saw to this, the Katsu master. And you can even see we had a an interest, that's actually Dr. Sato, with his armbands on. And you can see that this, first of all, it was in a very portable case, but also um, the unit was much smaller. So this was the um, Katsu Master. I'm just, I, I, unfortunately I didn't plug these in, so they're not charged, but this similar to the Nano or similar to the Cycle, uh, 2.0 or cycle three, cycle four that you have now had the same feature. So this, the really important thing to understand is that our, our protocols have not changed. It's just simply the equipment has changed to be much more portable, much faster, and um, uh, certainly longer battery life. So this was the Katsu Master. And from there, if you allow me, we developed the Katsu Master here. So this is the final version of the Katsu Master, which we um, have discontinued, and I'll explain why. Very good device that you can uh, record and keep track of multiple patients, all of their pressure settings, um, what, they're, what they've been doing. And we also had the ability to uh, connect to the pulse oximeter with this device as well. So any of you that are familiar with our B series, uh, we can um, capture the pulse oximeter um, readings, which are very important, certainly in the medical field um, for patients who are recovering from anything from injuries to uh, more, I'd say illnesses that are more um, related to cardiovascular um, conditions. So this was the final version of the Katsu Master. And you might ask, well, for the handheld version, we went from the Nano to the Cycle 2.0. So I, I think a lot of people either here today or have seen, even uh, on Tuesday's seminar, we had a, a customer who was talking about the pressure setting. So this is what we were referring to. We had the group and the pro, and we had low, medium, and high. And one thing you'll note, I believe this one also, is the screen is very, very small. So it's quite difficult for some people to see the screen. So this was, uh, Stephen, I believe 
In 2018, we came out with the cycle 2.0. Um, from there was probably our most significant improvement, not only with the handheld to the cycle three, the C3 that you all know, but also with the bands. So this is the C3, which I do have charged. And you see the cycle mode. Again, I won't go into more, just wanted to show the evolution of the equipment and the constant, but also the bands. And these are our current armbands, which are current for the C3 and the C4, which I'll show shortly that you see now we just have one simple side to tighten. Location is the same. If you compare, the narrowness is the same. So we've kept the same, uh, and that's very important is these narrow bands is really what, uh, I call it our secret sauce. I think it's really important to understand that that is where we get the comfort, the safety, and I'll emphasize the safety and the functionality of the band. So this is the current band. Uh, which is much easier because you simply tighten it with a single arm, uh, sorry, a single strap, same location. So that is the, the, the bands um, where they are now. Um, I will show, it's just kind of interesting. We had a, a moment where the bands, and I found these, Stephen, down in, in my treasure trove of katsu, the pink bands, that were more of a sort of a, um, to honor um, uh, the breast cancer awareness movement that we made the pink bands. Also for the Katsu Beauty and on the the, the female side, um, pink, even though I like pink too, Stephen. So think pink. Um, we did do a, a color variation of pink. I might open up a, a can of worms, people might say, well, I want pink, but here we have pink. Um, but again, the functionality was the same. And now we've gone from the C3 to the C4. So where we are now is, uh, and I see a question, C, but we'll get through this and then we'll go to our questions. The C4, so anyone that just received your C4 comes with a very nice carrying case open it up and you can see I still, I, I've already used mine, but I, I like to keep it in the packaging. It just keeps it uh, keeps it nice. So you can see that now the screen is much larger. It's a touch screen. So if you compare it to the C3, same size, but a much easier screen on and off button on the same, the side as was the um, C3 cycle mode and advanced arms and legs, and we can talk about this um, a little bit more. But with your C4, you get two sets of tubes. And uh, what's really important for people to know is when you do receive your unit, please note that there's a small um, a plug here. And now we have a little spot for it where people can't lose it. That's for doing single limb katsu, which is more on the rehabilitation or um, anyone who's suffered an injury or even our amputees. We work with a lot of amputees who um, actually only have one limb, either one leg or one arm and it allows them to do single limb uh, katsu. So this is the C4. Now what's really exciting is how we've gone into our B series, which is the Bluetooth series that we've talked about over the last few months. Um, this was the original B1. So I'll show you here. And what you'll note, and this is what made us start to think of, of progressing with the development of the B series is um, we had some challenges with people that the unit would come off depending on the shape of their arm or their leg. So there were a lot of people that this was moving around. So the B1 series and the B2 series, th there is some um, certainly some developments in the, the battery life and the compressor strength, but the uh, again, the modality is very similar where we can cycle with this. And if you see now with the new B2, um, it is slightly larger, but it sits on what we call a cradle uh, where it doesn't it doesn't move at all. And we we actually uh, 
for for um, any repairs, when if anyone does need a repair, they can send it in, and we, we have an engineer who can remove this very easily. But what we ask people is to leave it on the cradle so that they don't damage the air bladder inside. So you can see that the B series has gone from um, also uh, a landscape position to a portrait position, and that also. Uh, what we've seen with some of our professional athletes as well as our stay-at-home athletes has been a lot better on functionality. So that was kind of a semi-brief, but um, Stephen, I wonder if you have any uh, comments as I went quickly through all the equipment, anything I could demonstrate or show. Uh, you're on mute, Steve. Yeah, so the interesting thing is the form factor. So you use the silver James Bond case. That was um, about 14 pounds. Um, and it, it, it is pretty heavy. Um, but in there, uh, it was it was an analog. So uh, if you could show the, the face of the unit, um, Chris, where the, the people, the practitioners used to toggle using these buttons here. Um, but everything here, the protocols, the pressures, et cetera, used here and with our latest uh, B2 model, the pressures are all the same. Uh, that is because when uh, that unit was actually developed in 2004, in 2004, the uh, protocols were already, protocols and pressures were already well established. The bands themselves have not changed. The internal air bladder has not changed. So even though the form factor of the unit went from a 14 pound James Bond case down to a Bluetooth uh, non-connected uh, controller, the pressures, the protocols um, and the bands themselves have not changed at all. So um, when something it works, there's no need to change it. Um, and we just went from the large 14 pound unit to very small handheld uh, controllers. That was more for the convenience of people using it at uh, their home or in travel or work. So that that's about all. That's the only uh, advantage. And the the other thing, the small pressure meter that that Chris showed, actually, it, the reason why that came into being is. Uh, around 2001, Dr. Sato was showing this to cardiologists at the University of Tokyo Hospital. And although they understood the mechanism of katsu and they understood ex what Dr. Sato was doing, they also said that they needed to standardize the pressures used. So Dr. Sato actually went to the local um, auto parts uh, supply store, bought this unit modified it for use, and then he was able to standardize the amount of pressures that were used in Katsu. So this is a, uh, this is just an off-the-shelf device that Dr. Sato used. And very coincidentally, this auto parts um, product were actually used in the cardiology department at the University of Tokyo Hospital in order to start standardizing things. And those uh, pressure levels that we now call standard Katsu units or SKU are still to this day uh, true to the original pressures. So that's about the only other additional information that was uh, part of Katsu history. Um, we have a question, um, Chris, maybe we can get to it. It's a pretty interesting yeah. question. Yeah. I, I, it's a long one. So um, I'm going to read the question. When doing strength training using the katsu armbands over the last nine months, I've noticed that my arms have had a much greater increase in size proportionally than my chest. My arm measurements have increased by 25%, but my chest has barely changed at all. I use adjustable dumbbells with a bench for doing flat bench press, inclined bench press, flat flies, and incline, incline flies along with a couple tricep exercises at the end. I do this once a week, oh, I'm sorry, one day a week along with push-ups another day, biceps on another day, shoulders on another day. Um, so it appears one, 
two, three. It appears that he does uh, katsu on his upper body four times a day. Some of those days he does those, um, he uses the dumbbells and does a variety of, of chest exercises. And then uh, another day he does push-ups. Another day he works on his biceps. Another day he works on his shoulders. The question continues. It seems by using the armbands when doing chest exercises, your arms tire quickly as expected and they benefit greatly. However, since the chest muscles are not directly targeted by the bands, they don't tire out the same way and don't get pushed far enough to activate the muscles to grow. What is the optimal way to increase chest size? Should I be using the arm bands? I'm sorry, should I be using the leg bands when doing chest exercises, including push-ups instead? Okay, so um, we uh, this is a good question because a lot of people uh, say, well, I understand how my arms can increase in size and strength, uh, but how does my chest or core uh, concurrently um, increase in size? So he's very correct in that when, if you have the armbands on and you're doing a bench press, that your smaller muscles of your biceps and triceps tire out before your chest, your pectoral or your shoulders even, um, are they're barely even fatigued. We That is true. So if your focus is on your um, chest, then we recommend, uh, as Dr. Sato does, to work on your chest at least three times a week. So if I read the question right, you do one day with working on the biceps, one day working on the shoulders, one day working on the uh, push-ups, and one day working on your triceps and a bench and various kinds of bench press. So in this case, you're working two days, one with push-ups and one with bench press. Um, and I understand from your question that your your arms tire out before your chest does. In these cases, I think what you uh, what we recommend you do is put the pressure of the bands lower. So what is happening is you're absolutely right. When you have the bands at a certain pressure, your arms tire out before. Put the pressure much lower on the arm bands. So you actually feel fatigue in your chest, whether you're doing push-ups or you're doing um, uh, bench press. That's uh, option number one. Option number two is exactly what you suggested or asked, and that is you could be uh, doing this these uh, arm and chest workouts with your leg bands on. It doesn't matter whether you have your arms or legs. If you have your leg bands on and you're moving around the gymnasium, especially if you're doing push-ups, push-ups are great with the leg bands because your legs are actually in a static position and it's a it's a, a type of isometric exercise, although you're going up and down slightly. So in this case, you could be max, maxing out your uh, chest muscles as you have the bands on your legs. So that's option uh, number two. Option number three is to increase, uh, I'm sorry, uh, option number three would be to increase the number of repetitions that you do on your arms. So for example, when you're doing your arms, you might be doing, I don't know, uh, uh, let's say 20 repetitions. When you get to your shoulders, I'm sorry, when you get to your chest, so when you do the bench press, when you do the flat flies, and when you do the incline, uh, incline flies, um, any kind of bench press exercise, make sure, and this is very, very important, possibly the most important uh, part of all of uh, these recommendations is to move your arm very, very slowly in the eccentric and concentric direction. So in the up and down directions, move your arm very slowly up and down. Now, in the case that uh, your arms give out more, then reduce the, the, the pressure even more. If you need to put a two finger pressure, uh, 
two finger tightness on, uh, do so. So those three methods, one, use the, um, uh, put a lower pressure, two, um, uh, use the bands on your legs, and three, when you're doing the push-ups or when you're doing the bench press, inc uh, incline uh, press, flies, move at a much slower pace. So even if you're only doing three bench press, you're going up at one, two, three, four, five, and then down one, two, three, four, five. So those are three, three recommendations uh, that you can do. And um, always make sure, of course, to uh, reduce or limit the time in between each um, exercise to 20 seconds rest. If your your, your arms are just, they're, they're too tired, that's okay. Rest a little bit more. And then lastly, uh, one of the things that Dr. Sato does to work on his core and his chest is, remember, when we're doing katsu, we are producing a lot of lactate. That's why your arms are fatiguing. That sends a signal to the brain, and then the brain releases growth hormone. Growth hormone goes out uh, to the body through the vascular system, and then it, it, it works on each uh, individual receptor in the cell that that's why your muscles grow but that takes time it takes about 12 minutes so when dr sato or others want to focus on a very specific movement or a very specific muscle group what you can do what you should do is actually do katsu do what you normally do then take the bands off take the bands off because you're hormonally optimized 12 minutes after you take the bands off. This is why if we're uh, working with Olympic athletes or professional athletes or someone giving a TED talk, et cetera, we recommend that the bands are released ideally 12 minutes before the start of your race, the tournament, the performance, the speech, what have you. Because at that point, metabolically speaking, you're optimized. It's not during katsu that you optimize. There, there, there takes some time for the mechanism of katsu uh, to, to peak. And if you want to perform at your peak, so if Dr. Sato wants to perform, let's say uh, he wants to do some bench press or core exercise, et cetera, he'll take the bands off, then do a specific movement and in the case of, let's say, uh, a wrestler, a boxer, a com combative athlete, let's say it's a runner, a swimmer who's practicing on their starts, they would take the bands off. And by the take, take time you take the bands off, maybe hydrate, go in position, get ready, et cetera, some amount of time is elapsed. And then you could be doing your chest workout then. So that's uh, the fourth uh, way that you can uh, optimize a katsu in order for you to increase your chest size. Okay. Chris, I think, uh, yeah, no, that, that, thank you. And I think what, what you emphasize, Steve, and just to, you know, so that we have it also on this recording is people really it's, we, we constantly think that it's only what's happening distal to the band. And I know I'm repeating what you already said, but e even for this, person who asked the question, um, the recommendation, Steve, I, I would support 100%. And I, I would also say that, um, you know, there, there, it, it, it could be more of a result of what you're actually doing for the repetitions and the weights than it is the katsu. It is systemic. So there will be, you know, again, we've seen healing in the body, in the foot by doing katsu on the arm. So there, it is a systemic, it's just a little bit uh, longer of a process because, of course, if you're doing bicep curls with katsu, your biceps are going to get bigger. If you do bicep curls all the time without katsu, your biceps are going to get bigger. So it's really uh, just understanding the, the physiology of it. So thank you for that explanation, Steve. All right. Well, we'll be back here uh, Tuesday for our uh, office hours where we'll take a variety of questions. Any questions at all? And we'll get this posted. And thank you very much, Chris, for showing the 
original bands, the Katsu Master, the Katsu Master Mini, the Katsu Nano, the Katsu uh, uh, Cycle 2.0, you didn't actually see. That was in there. Oh, uh, yeah. No, I right here. Oh, you did? Oh, okay. Yeah, there it goes. And then the uh, B1, C2, uh, C3, and I, C4. I, I actually will admit, Stephen, I kind of forgot that we had the Katsu Cycle that was the same as the Nano and, until yes. I found it. And uh, it's 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 actually it's a, a brilliant um a device. Yeah, we actually also had Katsu Golf that we sold in Japan. Um, it was the same thing as as the Katsu Nano and uh, the Katsu Cycle, but we actually um, branded it as Katsu Golf. Uh, golf is quite popular in Japan, especially with a lot of older uh, men and women, and uh, we we marketed this product to those who wanted to either increase their functional strength, increase their club head speed, or had some kind of injury that impacted their uh, golf game. So um, and, but uh, it was the exact same model. This this um, uh, presentation today, Steve, we're going to put in a more formal uh, PD, um, uh, a, a PowerPoint presentation that we'll hopefully have on our website. And even one thing we didn't talk about today, because uh, I'm, I'm actually going to get get some of the equipment from you is Dr. Sato was the first to um, integrate Katsu into clothing. Um, yes. And uh, we will be showing that and really uh, uh, adding that as part of not only visually, but on our social media, showing that Dr. Sato actually came up with that concept uh, before anyone. Um, so uh, contrary to what some some of the information that's out there, uh, uh, as Katsu is the original, um, also with the uh, the concept of clothing as well. Yes, yes. You so know, uh, Chris, it, it's uh, interesting because uh, Dr. Sato uh, invented all these things in Japan. The information was exclusively in Japanese. And we already know that uh, about 15 years after the Navy SEALs, uh, their, their top commander actually um, assigned their um, some of the Navy SEALs to actually go around the world and find find all of the latest and greatest technologies that could help the American uh, special forces uh, become more resilient. Uh, resilient meaning stronger, faster, but also uh, less uh, likely to get injured, etc. And they, they did that. They found fascinating technologies around the world. And uh, 15 years after that happened, the Navy SEAL started to incorporate Katsu. And one of the original guys who uh, was on that task force to go around the world um, told me, uh, or I said when he told me about his, his assignment many years ago, I said, uh, why, didn't you, uh, why didn't you find Katsu? And he says, who knew? I, no, we, we scoured the world, um, mostly in the English speaking countries, but also in Europe, and they never actually went to Japan. They never actually thought that Japanese had any kind of uh, human performance or rehabilitation technology that they should look at. And so, um, and this is true because until, you know, I accidentally met Dr. Sato, nobody would have ever known about uh, Katsu outside of people who speak, read and write Japanese. And so when all of these other companies out there uh, and almost all of them have claimed to be the first in a variety of things to give them the benefit of the doubt. They believe because of their information is either limited to Denmark or Sweden or the U.S., et cetera, in their own language or in the English language, they think that they are first. Um, it's simply because they didn't actually, like the Navy SEALs, understand that Katsu had a many, many uh, uh, years and, and decades actually of experience with people of various uh, ages and abilities and walks of life. Chris, you know that you know we started using Katsu uh, amongst Olympians back in 1988. Back in 1988, at the Summer Olympics in Seoul, Katsu was first used in the Olympics. This is literally literally 30 years before the first quote 
BFR uh, company was, um, you know, claimed that they were the first. So, um, you know, 1988, then 1990, 92, 94, all the winter and summer Olympic games, Katsu has been used very stealthily, very confidentially by a lot of athletes. And so, you know, to give these other companies the benefit of the doubt, they didn't know what we were doing with Katsu. They didn't know what athletes were doing with Katsu. They didn't know what people were doing with Katsu who had, you know, had cancer, broken bones, you know, car accident victims, et cetera. So, um, but thank you very much for showing and sharing this history, because I think it is important that people, the medical community, the physical therapy community and consumers understand where cut the, the information we're sharing with Katsu actually is based on decades of practical clinical experience and athletic performance. So thank you again, Chris, for sharing. Yeah, this no, history. exciting. And uh, stay tuned. Yeah. All right. For the future. Yes. Take care. Bye, everyone. Bye.